Hey everybody, I just wanted to give you a heads up that the audio on the episodes 6 and 7 is a little rough. I procrastinated a little too much and we lost um, Rob's audio files because uh, I waited too long and he purged them. So that is that is on me, that is my fault. Um, they are certainly listenable, but they are not quite the audio uh, quality that I usually put into these things. Although you may not even be able to tell because I am very new at this. So I uh, just wanted to give you that heads up before we get uh, underway here. And uh, hopefully you enjoy the show. Captain's Luck, Supplemental. Yesterday was Commander Nielsen's birthday, but she'd agreed to cover a double on the bridge due to Lieutenant Commander Vaal picking up that bug on Dorian 4. The bridge crew worked out a plan with the ensign manning the transporter room to beam her to every major operational area as a surprise so that she could still celebrate with the crew. Well, Lieutenant Fields and Engineering had the bright idea of getting everyone party poppers. Turns out, confetti doesn't mix well with rapid series transporter sessions. Commander Nielsen is looking extra festive up on the bridge, while Dr. Rain figures out how to separate colored paper from human skin as gently as possible. Nielsen didn't look too pleased when I referred to her as First Officer Funfetti. It's definitely gonna stick. Everybody, uh, my name is Matthew Stanford, and you are listening to Captain's Log Supplemental. Uh, joining me, as always, we have Rob, hello, and Christopher. Hey there, folks. Do you prefer Chris or Christopher? I've always called you Chris, but I never asked. I don't think. Uh, I go by Chris mostly, but oh, I don't okay. mind Christopher. Uh, I see. Okay. Because usually, because my first name is Matthew, and everyone calls me Matt, and I fucking hate it, so. <laughs> I've made it a habit of asking. Um, Rob, I know better, so I know he goes by Rob. Um, so anyways, this is a uh, Star Trek rewatch podcast is actually the term for this kind of podcast. I remembered this week, so we'll actually start using that word. Um, we are going through the episodes in chronological order inside the universe. So we are starting with Enterprise. This is... Uh, uh, we're on season one, episode six, I believe it's the Terra Nova episode and who boy, uh, it's a, who it's an episode. It is, it is one of the episodes I've ever seen. It, yeah, it, it, it episodes probably the hardest out of any of the first six of them. Mm. Oh, except for maybe that one where they're stuck on that planet for no fucking reason. Sure. Sure. Um, so I'm going to start with a little summary, then we'll get to kind of a deep dive, and then we'll ca cap the episode off with some kind of random bullshit. Um, so this episode of Enterprise cold opens on um, a, a Roanoke colony-esque mystery that uh, apparently has happened in the Star Trek universe. Uh, a, a planet named Terra Nova has a colony, a human colony on it that went missing. And... Um, Travis and I believe Hoshi are talking about it uh, when the captain just walks the fuck up and asks if they're there yet, even though they're three hours from being there, because apparently Captain Archer doesn't know shit about what's going on ever. Look, Captain Archer's a doer. He's not a planner. He just does. I, could, <laughs> I couldn't tell if it was supposed to be like a ha ha ha. He's being funny. But if so, that was not acted well, like. Cause it looked like he was very serious. Um, so yes, it turns out, um, the, uh, the colony on Terra Nova, the great experiment we get, we get a nice bit of exposition here was whether or not humans could settle, uh, outside of our solar system because we already had, you know, a base on, was it new Berlin on the moon and Planitia Utopia or whatever? Utopia Planitia Utopia yeah, Planitia, on, yeah. on Mars. They, uh, so they're like, well, we found a planet that's less than 20 light years away. So we're going to go there. It took them nine years to get there. So I meant to do some math. I don't know what warp they were at. If it took nine years to go 20 light years, but it was obviously not very fast. Warp, not fast. Yes. And then, um, I guess there was some kind of issue because Earth's like, okay, it looks like your colony's going okay. We're going to send another 200 people. And the colony was like, fuck you, Jackson. We can't handle another 200 people on this entire fucking planet that we're living on. 
<laughs> yeah, I thought I thought that was an interesting one. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It, I didn't get a good sense of when, like, how long had passed since they settled and since the another ship of people was showing up. So, like, I don't know how long they had been there before they were like, fuck you, we don't want anyone else. But it was, it was that seems like an abrupt thing that happened. Um, also, in this, they decide after they lose contact with them that all of a sudden sending a ship would take too long, I guess. Even though I, they were already gonna send a ship so to be fair i do appreciate that like an 18 year round trip might be too long because they don't know what happened and that's a lot of unknowns to just send people out for nine years i get that although on the same line to paul was like hey why didn't you ask the vulcans for help we could have gotten there in a few days or whatever their fucking warp capabilities are and Trip's like, well, asking for help for the Vulcans comes with too high a price. Motherfucker, there are lives on the line. And you're worried about how, like, the, the Vulcans are going to chastise you for asking for help? What the fuck? Although, to be fair, later on in the episode, to Paul's solution to getting some belligerent people off world was um, questionable. <laughs> Although she was also kind of weirdly the voice of reason, too. We're going to get back to that. I think that's what we're going to deep dive today. So, Okay. Yeah, T'Pol was a was kind of a weird foil to everybody in this episode. So, uh, let's see. They show up, and T'Pol's like, the colony appears to be intact from orbit, so I'm not sure what that means, because Tuck, uh, Tuck Trip also said uh, uh, it looks to be a ghost town. So I'm not sure what she was looking at, where she's like, the colony seems to be intact, because Trip was like, no, it's not. Fuck you. Um, And there's this moment where they're trying to figure out why they're not seeing any people there. They're not, they haven't landed yet. And they're, and to Paul says, well, there's some radiation on the surface that, that may be something that, you know, that may be something that explains it. Oh, okay, great. Well, it's only 800 millirads. So a few hours exposure shouldn't hurt us. Um, you have suits for this. <laughs> like, I it, didn't understand why, like, yeah. Okay. 800 millirads, okay for a couple hours. Fine. Why even risk it? Exactly. Why not wear the hazmat suit? Wear a suit. At least wear a suit. Like, I understand if the helmets are constrictive or whatever, so you let your head have a few hours of exposure because your head's relatively, you know, you're not going to be infertile because your head got a couple, you know, a couple extra doses of x-ray or whatever. But, like, wear a suit. You have suits. All of space is filled with radiation. That's what the suits are designed to deal with. Um, so they get down to the colony. It turns out these people have been silent for a little over 70 years. Uh, 70 years didn't do shit to that colony. It looks great. Like a little bit of rustoleum and well built. some like brooms to brush off some of the debris on the road. And that colony is as good as fucking new. Like it is, it is ready to go 70 years. Uh, they spot some kind of local that runs off and Reed gives chase. Um, he chases the local into a cave and Archer and T'Pol catch up and they're like, all right, well, we're going to have to go inside this cave. So Archer calls back to Travis to grab some flashlights because these are the least prepared people that have ever left a spaceship. Mm. Um, look, dude, this guy forgot this many times already. Food. I like, forgot their food when they had to break camp. <laughs> but like, it's one thing to forget your food because there's an emergency going on. Why don't they have flashlights? They were explicitly planning to explore an abandoned colony. Like even in high noon, buildings are dark inside. What, what was the plan? Yes. Uh, so they go inside the cave. They see a cute little armadillo things, but it was adorable. Like the best practical effects in the show so far. <laughs> um, yeah, they're kind of in the cave. They don't really understand what the plan is. Um, there's a slow pan over like all of the stuff that's in the cave. So it turns out that these people who have been living on this colony, um, like they've been hunting animals for their skins and these armadillo things for their shells. And they've been making crude clothing and tools and apparently sophisticated wax candles because mm -hmm. that was impressive. Um, Delicious soups, too, apparently. Yes, yes, yes. They've been uh, they've been f cooking, I guess. <laughs> um, 
So they find some people in the cave. Uh, the people are not happy to see them. They fire at them with real guns, like like bullet shooting guns, which was kind of fun. I get it, like because it's like a throwback, right? Because they're you know they, they've got older tech because they didn't mm-hmm. have the face pistols, or whatever. Um, there's no fucking way those guns work after seventy years. Yeah. Let alone that they have ammunition still. I mean, you think they would have been expending that for like you know survival? Can I ask what? Is this the only time in a Star Trek series where we see firearms in like a a modern setting? Like not, you know, barring them going back in time. Mm. Um, the only other is. thing I can think, yeah, the holodeck is the only other exception I can think of because um, there they <laughs> Jean Luc absolutely houses a fucking couple of Borg with a Tommy gun in in first contact. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I do recall that they. Uh, there was I forget even which Star Trek it is, but they visited like a more primitive civilization that still had you know guns like that. That's the only other thing I can think of. Like the only other like gunpowder instance I could think of was the famous Kirk versus Gorn fight. Uh, where like he has to make gunpowder. Yeah, I, I I'm gonna be very interested in what my memory serves of that episode because it's one of the few episodes of the original series I've seen. But does it like he like spend all this time and effort making this like shitty cannon and the Gorn's just like, I'll just make a knife and then stabs him. Uh huh. Brilliant. Accurate. Um, so yeah, the gun still worked. It's been 70 years, but they're still, they're still doing all right. So cool. That's fun. Um, they get a little lost because they're running from gunfire and take a wrong turn in the caves. Okay, fine. That makes sense. Um, to Paul's like, Turn left after three meters. There's no turn there. So she says, correction, 10 meters. So they turn there. I do not understand the purpose of that bit of dialogue and that, like, why did that happen? It's fine if T'Pol makes a mistake or whatever, but like, what was the writing purpose of that moment? Because it didn't matter. It was just time filler. To show that Americans are still confused by the metric system. (laughs) No, but it was to Paul. To Paul made the mistake. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wait, I have no idea. So weird. Um, one of the uh, natives comes out and jumps Travis. Um, I do appreciate that Starfleet hand-to-hand tactics are hold your enemy up so your buddy can stun them because that worked <laughs> real fucking well. I'm just waiting till they devise two hand punching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got to come soon, right? Um. They run back to the the shuttle pod. Uh, Reed was shot in the cave, so they let like Archer, like a like a good commander, just left him behind. He um, said he was fine. Why would he doubt him? He I'm didn't saying say that sarcastically. No, he didn't say he was fine. Then he just vanished. He got like abducted. no, he did. Yeah, he did came he? back. Archer was like, uh, I don't think Archer even said anything. He just like checked on him because he wasn't right behind him. And Malcolm goes, I'm fine. But then Dude, gets... he stuck his head back through like the tiny little hole he had just finished crawling through. Right. Yeah. Looked at Reed and Reed's just like, I'm fine. And then Archer, instead of, you know, lending him a hand or going back to help him back up to his feet because he had just been shot. He just ditches him. He was busy Turns doing and moves, <laughs> you know, because Americans famously have an ethos for uh, for leaving people behind. Um, um. So, uh, I'm not even sure their guns can actually hurt a shuttle pod, but they they fled that fucking scene. They left Reed fast. Fuck that guy. Um, and they go back to the ship and try to figure out what they're uh, going to do. Um, I have a bunch of notes on how improbable this timeline is, but we're going to get to that in a moment. But at one point... Um, you know, they're like, hey, let's let's attack this stronghold and get read out. We'll use stun grenades or whatever. And Archer's like, no, if I don't if I can't even if I can't even make contact with these humans, I don't have any business being out here. And yeah, I we all agree. You don't have any business. Being out here. <laughs> uh, so they go back down. Uh, Archer and uh, Flocks go back down to go help Reed. And they allow themselves to be uh, captured by the Terra Novans, who are, of course, just humans who have been there, you know, living with the radiation, etc. Um, they this is the first time we listen to the whack ass Terra Novan language, which is. Oh, my God. Bafflingly so, inconsistent. It's 
it's real bad. Also, I mean, I'm pretty sure that a language wouldn't deteriorate so far. So this is this is my timeline. Generation. This is in my timeline notes as well. And I, I, I do agree, however, they did point out that the only people that survived the initial radiation were like four and five year olds, right? So like I can appreciate a substantial amount of deterioration because four and five year olds simply don't know a lot of language. Right. I mean, maybe. Like, okay. It wasn't just the language. It was the culture, their physiology. Like, right. That so, was a lot to change in sense. Actually, I had a question about the physiology. Do we think that shit on their face was supposed to be like a mutation or was it just mud? I thought it was mud. Somebody, somebody said it was scales. What? Right. Reed said that at the beginning, but I assumed that he just misinterpreted what he was looking at. But I mean, maybe... Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was just mud, right? Because, like, even the, the lady who'd been there from the beginning had the mud on her face. like Right. And sh she shouldn't have had scales. Right, right. Um, so, I, I, but, so, the language is fucking ridiculous. Because, of course, it's going to be like this, this old timey, like, oh, in the before times this, in the before times that, and whatnot. And, like, okay, so maybe their children, the, the, the only people that survived the initial colony because of the radiation are four- and five-year-olds. So, like, they don't have a lot of language. That's great. But, like, she had to have known the word for parent. Right. Or, like, mother or father. So, But she's referring to her parents as my go-befores. Yeah. Which is baffling. Also, they don't have a word for hour. They don't know the word hours. Um, the guy's just confused as shit by the even mere concept that the time might be divided by less than a day. Mm. Um, yeah. Anyways, Phlox is helping, like says, eh, like, you know, Reed, Reed's stabilized. He'll probably be okay. He can walk, but we need to get him up. So I get the bullet out of his leg. Uh, the Terran Ovens are like, can you fucking leave and never look back? And Archer's like, well, no, you should come back with us. And they're like, no, we don't want to. And then Phlox kind of surreptitiously scans the woman who looks like she's sick. Uh, turns out she's got some kind of lung cancer, which is awful. But he's like, yeah, we can treat that shit. No problem. Um, that was my favorite scene from the entire episode. It's just Phlox standing next to Archer with his little scanning device, just fiddling with it. Mm -hmm. And then like, it's just this blue glowing light. How, like, if they really were as undeveloped as, as the episode, like, leads us to believe, how were they not questioning what he was doing and freaking out? I mean, they made they made candles, so they're not that undeveloped. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I do appreciate that Archer's like, like, um, we could take you up, we can get you treated. And uh, we need to take Reed back to get treated. And Phlox is like, nah, he'll be fine. Leave him. Fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, uh, shit. All right. So they take they take the uh, the Terranovan, the, this Terranovan and his like this Terranovan that's kind of speaking for everyone and his mom who has lung cancer back up to Enterprise. Um, we did not get a scene where they are freaking out about the heights from the shuttle pod. But I imagine in my head canon that that is what happens. Um, then they're trying to explain like, oh, you know, you're actually humans. You're not different from us, oh, but we are different and our language is weird. Duh. And Archer showing the least amount of patience that has ever been exhibited on screen gives up immediately. And some dramatic music as he's like, tell me when they're fucking ready to go. Fuck this shit. And walks out of the, <laughs> the sick bay. He um, is a doer. He ain't got no time for that. He was super petulant. Like it, it was, was, it was it hard was, to watch. It was hard to watch. Uh, turns out an asteroid hit the planet and created a cloud of radioactive dust. That's what happened. Um, I guess the colony didn't have a way to figure out that that's what happened when it was happening to them. Also, I understand that Archer and his crew are full of fucking morons, so they don't wear radioactive suits. Did the colonists not have any kind of radioactive protection either? It's a space crew. Like, none? Nope. Okay. Um, like, they they should have at least had a means, I guess not, if it was just a single stage, like, craft, but you would think that they would have some means of, you know, flying. So I wondered about that, too. Um, they mentioned one of the people from the colony being able to fire on a ship in orbit. 
So they obviously had something that could reach orbit, whether it was just a weapon or not. Um, but they, you know, okay. So they disassembled their ship. So maybe they can't fly anymore. That's fine. Ships are going to be radioactive proof. So like, Surely, once they realized that the radiation was, like, spiking, they could have all just, like... And I know radiation's kind of the silent killer. You know, there, there comes a point where you get such a lethal dose that you don't even recognize until you're dead. But, like, I feel like that couldn't have been that bad because the kids were fine. So it had to be a slow enough radiation that the kids' bodies were able to adapt. Which means that, like, couldn't y'all just huddle in one of the buildings made out of the spaceship and, like, figured out a plan? What they should have done, from the sounds of it, was use their children as radioactive shielding. Yeah, exactly. They should have worn... It's like, yeah, like just strap them to their chest. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, so we cut back to Reed, who's um, uh, getting some food, which is basically barely cooked digger meat. What, what was the point of this scene? Uh, to show us that the kids have musical skulls. They're very progressed for, like, a barely a generation gone by. Hmm. Like those skulls were well in tune. <laughs> yeah, I was. Uh, I'm like, I'm like, was this just to show you that Malcolm was still alive? Like, I did. Uh, nothing happened in that scene. This is the part where like they start having these very deep conversations about whether or not they should just force these people to relocate back to Earth. Um, an uncomfortable mention of a slave ship went by, but it was the early 2000s, so I'm gonna let it slip for the moment. Um, there's a lot of like, to Paul's reasoning was a lot of like, and we're going to get back. We're going to, I think this is what we're going to go into for the deep dive. So, but to Paul's reasoning is more like it's, they've been here for more than two generations. It's been 70 years. No, they haven't. They've been here for right. barely two generations. Um, yeah, <laughs> tried to gut our go before it's fucking, you don't know the word parents. That is my note. Um, <laughs> I also asked, so is the face stuff mud or like a mutation? So, uh, Archer is impatient again, almost immediately dramatic music storms out of the room, like a petulant child, as Rob pointed out, Archer says, basically we can't force them to return. That's not our, that's not our ethos, but we can't take no for an answer while we're convincing them. That's the same thing. You're going to do what I want. And you're going to like it. Like if you can't take no for an answer while you're convincing someone, you're then forcing them to do it. That's what that means. Um, okay. So a little bit of math. Um, I went out to the wiki. Do you know when to Paul was born? Do you know how old she is? She's supposed to be like a hundred at the, at the, at this point, isn't she? Not quite. She was born in 20, 2088 and it is currently 2151. Which means that she is, um, I did the math earlier, but now I've lost that particular portion of the math. Uh, was that like 63? Okay. Okay. Her pointing out that like, this is the only life they've known for three generations rings a little hollow when this entire incident in these like distant past that they're trying to imply happened only 12 years before she was born. Like, this is not that long ago. Yeah, that's the, that's one of the main problems I have with the episode. Not that specifically, just the whole time frame of it. Yeah. It just, I couldn't, I couldn't. It didn't the, work. The, the disbelief could not be suspended. I'm right. usually pretty good at suspending disbelief and, and just going with the story, but I just, I couldn't do right. it with this. 70 years was not enough. I would have rather them say, like, some kind of weird temporal bullshit happened and the colony got pushed like into the past by a bunch of years or whatever. And so they've been living for like 400 years without contact or some nonsense like that. It happened in a uh, Stargate universe. Like, I think the whole point was to make it so that, um, Nadette, Bernadette, right. The, the mm -hmm. old woman, I think it was to make it feasible that she could be that old and just barely remember like life on Terra Nova before the asteroid. I, I, I think, think that's what they were going for. I think it was an accident. If I'm going to be honest, I think the writers thought of this kind of fun, like, Oh, this lost colony that doesn't speak English correctly and stuff. And they were kind of putting it all together and they, they were really happy with it. And then they realized the timeline doesn't work. 
And so that's when they realize like, oh, we've got a 70 year window for this to happen. And then there's like, ah, fuck it. That's the only way I can imagine this story getting written because mm. 70 years is not a lot of time. It really isn't. Yeah. For the, for the scope of what was supposed to have happened to these people, it's, it's not. Also, if it was just four and five year olds that survived, ain't no way in hell they survived <laughs> after all these adults um, died. Motherfucker, you tell that to little Riker from Montana. <laughs> you know what? Fair point. I, I, I could see the point. Withdraw my argument. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's see. Uh, apparently they know the word for bones, but not ours, I found. Oh, yeah. So they fall through this hole in the shuttle in the shuttle pod. It seems like they're falling for a while, but they go eight whole meters. Wait, I missed that. It was just eight meters. Eight meters. Eight meters. I know. I know. It feels like it's have either of you seen Undercover Brother? No. Oh, OK, well, then that reference won't mean anything. But um, yeah, it, it, it's like this very dramatic, long extended. It's got to be like a minute and a half of them, like, like jerking around in the pot as it falls through the ground and stuff. There's like a commercial break in there and stuff. And then it's eight meters. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they barely made it to the second floor of a building. <laughs> Like it reminded me of when I was a kid and they still had the 10,000 leagues under the sea ride at Disney world. And like you get on it and they're like, okay, we're going to do a deep dive all the way down to the bottom. And you like, you're, you're like six feet underwater. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, the, um, so they, they fall into a cave system and the, uh, the Terranovans that are with them already know where they are. So that's fine. They get out. The lead Terranovan asks for Arthur's pistol. Arthur Archer's pistol. Um, I don't know why he just did. He just kind of did. There was no reason for it whatsoever. And Archer was like, "Well, all right, here, take my pistol, I think, whatever." I think the initial thought was that because they were going back into their kind of, you know, t I don't even know what to call it, colony, city, town, settlement, underground cave area. He didn't want him to be armed. I guess. But Man, also he, he didn't, didn't sound like he was going to defend Archer against something that lived in the cave. Yes, that's exactly what it sounded like. Or he needed it to, like, get through the caves in some way, shape, or form. Yeah, I don't know. I couldn't. I don't know. I, there was this whole I have discussion a more important of question. Well, that's, that's where I'm coming from, is I thought it was like a trust thing, right? Like, he didn't trust him yet, so he wanted to take his weapon away from him. But I have, I have a more important question about this weapon. So in a couple of seconds, when they find that dude stuck under the tree and they yep. go to pick him up, they, he asks for his pistol back. But in the previous shot, Travis chucked him another one. I think that was a Not flashlight, really actually. Was uh, he armed. threw him a flashlight. Oh, it was a flashlight. Yes, I, I know because in my notes, I have this whole thing of like, did they not have more pistols on the shuttle pod? Like, if this guy wants a pistol, that's great. I didn't think about the fact that he wanted to, he was not trying to gain a pistol. He was trying to disarm Archer. I did not think of it that way, which like that may have been what they were going for. I think it was poorly executed. I agree. The way the guy acted. And by the way, this actor, you will see another couple times in Star Trek. He's also been in other oh, stuff. Yeah. He's like a, he's like a bit actor. Um, yeah. I recognized him. The way he acted felt very like, like, like Rob said, like he needed the pistol in order to protect Archer from something. Um, yes. So, uh, yeah. So a guy is stuck under a tree. One of the Terranovans, um, the, it's supposed to be this big moment. Cause the Terranovans like, will you risk your bones to save one of ours? And Archer's like, I guess like, let's just climb down and get him. And they had to track together. They had to go together. Right. Um, the guy went along the cliff wall down the spiral that leads straight to the person who's stuck under the tree. Archer immediately fell just, just instantaneously fell um, because he sucks at literally everything. He's the worst person. He, he is the least capable person that has ever existed. Um, the Terranovan saves him. Okay, great. They go down. Archer's like, give me my pistol. And the guy's like, no. He's like, give me my pistol. You have to trust me like I trusted you. And the guy's like, I guess, fine, whatever. It's super dramatic. Fucking Archer, just explain to him what you're going to do. It, yeah, I like, can use it to cut the log is a very yeah, short sentence. It's a super short sentence. It's a way shorter than you're going to have to learn to trust me. 
It's like, I'm going to cut the log. Oh, okay. Here. <laughs> then they get back to their colony and Bernadette wants uh, to tell everyone that they found an alternate place for the Terranovans to live on another continent that also has caves that didn't have radiation. So that way it's like the, the, the compromise They're They're not going to die from, Oh yeah. Their water supply was contaminated. Like, so they're, they're, they're kind of slowly right. dying. Um, I guess they do know the word South. So that was good. That, that, that saved a lot of time. I'm sure explaining, uh, what South means. So like they already knew the word South took some time to explain hours. I'm sure. But, um, <laughs> finally they're like, okay, great. I guess, I guess they got relocated. I don't know that we actually heard what the resolution was because I've watched it twice in the last 24 hours and I don't remember. I think it's just, it's, there wasn't actually any said resolution. I think the implication when Nadette speaks up and says, you know, listen to them. Oh, is that they, yeah, they are relocated, but they don't actually ever say that happens. Right. I mean, Trip does say that they saved them. Oh, okay. So well, it means that it. either That's they true. knocked them out and they've got them in the cargo hold, <laughs> or they relocated them to the southern hemisphere. Sure. So, okay. I, I feel like they, they could have. Keep... Go ahead. How, how are they going to keep the rest of Starfleet from just showing up? That's a good question. I didn't even think of that. You know what? Save that. Save that. Save that. Because that's 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 actually tangentially related to the deep dive today. No, that's a good one. Hold on to that thought. Because like Archer Archer asks um, Travis to write like a news blurb to send back to Ooh. Earth. Well, so he actually asks Travis, like, why don't you write the report? It's going to be front page news. So like I gather that the Enterprise is writing reports on what they're doing and sending them back to Starfleet. This one's going to be front page news. Cause it's, you know, the, the discovery of Terra Nova, whatever. Um, I do appreciate that. What he, Archer is basically saying is, Hey, tell you what, Travis, why don't you do my job tomorrow? Yeah. Um, but that's fine. I do like that Travis got to eat at the captain's table. That was nice. Um, but they were talking about like other disappearances and they named one that I didn't recognize and have already forgotten, but they also named Amelia Earhart, which is a nice circular, reference because I'm pretty sure this episode happened after the Voyager episode where they found Amelia Earhart. Uh, I didn't even think about that. Yeah. And then, so we, we end with, uh, Travis being exceedingly excited that he gets to do extra paperwork tomorrow. We. <laughs> so, uh, yes, that thought is burning bright in your head. Uh, we got to take a quick break there and then we will be right back with, with Rob's exciting. Uh. thought. are back so just before the break there rob you asked like what's to stop starfleet from coming back and that's a fantastic question because what i wanted to talk about tonight was like the ethics of all of this nonsense like is it immoral to just take them back and i understand like maybe not stun them against their will etc but assuming we didn't find the more habitable location in the southern part of the planet Cause that's, you know, deus ex machina right there. Like, would it have been okay to take them back to Paul's argument that like they have a culture? I'm not sure that holds up. It's been less than three full generations. And yeah, what is stopping Starfleet from just showing back up? There's a whole ass planet here. Yeah. And like, they may interpret this as a rescue operation. Sure. Even if they don't like take them back to earth, but they just show up and build another colony near them and like, you know, rehabilitate them back into society. Well, the, the culture part is, uh, is I think debatable. I, I do think it's valid to say, would they be able to be reintegrated into this, into society? And I think it's no is the correct answer there. I mean, if you've been, you know, hunter gathering your entire life, what is the chances you're going to be able to reintegrate into this advanced society? If, if the advanced society consisted of, if everyone doesn't do their job, we all die. So you better figure it out. I would agree with you. However, we're talking about a post scarcity society, right? Yeah, that's fair. Um, so like, you know, we're already in a point where there are people and this, this coming from someone who you know has a disability, there are people who are less capable than other people um, in terms of like their functionality in society. 
But, like, they can still live in society. It's okay. So even if these people are like, well, sorry, you're not going to be programming a computer. But, like, they can make candles. So, yeah, they, they, you know, they can, they can eat plentiful food and be well nutritioned and be, you know, taught to, to, to speak better or, or better. That's a wrong term to, to speak, you know, the, the, the common, you know, star English. Yeah. And learn to read and write and things like that. Um, Liam has a book about a woman who learned to read at 99 years old. True. I think both of your examples aren't quite the same though. Like well, in both so? of those, exa- well, in both of your examples, both in in you know your own disability and um, and this ninety nine woman, they were they were, even though they didn't have those education, they were raised in the society. They were around those things. They they saw those things. That's like it's that's true. But like I would say that again, we're only talking about seventy years. These people are also in that society, even if it is a more primitive version of a society. Like they speak Starfleet English, right? Or earth English or whatever existed 70 years ago. You know, they you're using guns. They are formulating their societal structure based on what they knew from before. Even if it is, you know, kind of a, kind of a splinter, you know? Sure. So are they like, and that's, I guess my point, are they a separate culture? Like, just because they forgot a bunch of shit because they, all the adults died doesn't mean they're a separate culture. Even even if they if we, if we say, no, they're not a separate culture, yes, they could integrate. Is it still the right thing to do? To take somebody against their will away from their home? So, even if it's to save them? Right, and that's that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that, to be honest. Because, like, yeah, let's, let's assume that they can't just relocate them to another part of the planet. Like, is it right to forcibly dislocate people from their home in order to save their lives in america we have an answer to that question and the answer is yes like that happens all the time with like flood evacuations and stuff people are forcibly removed from their homes in order to prevent them from being flood victims i mean not everybody listens Oh yeah, and we don't have the personnel to actually do it, but it is it does happen. So like I guess like doctrinally, I guess is my point. The American, you know, ethos is they don't force them though. I mean they they will try and they will they will do their damnedest to get people into a safer situation. But if people refuse, they leave them. I mean, look what happened up in Centralia in PA. You know, there there are still people who live there. Like the federal government took away their zip code so that it would be inconvenient to live there and they still stayed. Sure. The, the, yeah. And that's kind of a longer term kind of squatting situation. But uh, lacking any sources right in front of me, I'm pretty sure that the uh, you can be arrested for not evacuating and they will evacuate you for you. Interesting. Um, especially in cases where it's not just like a hurricane where like, okay, you might be all right. It's just gonna be windy or whatever. But like the fires in California, I, I, I guarantee you that eh, I can't guarantee that, but I'm pretty sure that the doctrine was if you need to arrest people so that you can save their lives. And I mean, I'm not surprised. America has a very, very toxic understanding of suicide, right? Like we do not allow that to exist. It is a crime in some states. Most of modern society has that view. And I'm not saying it's the right view. I'm just saying. No, no, no yeah. No, I, and I don't, I don't disagree. Um, that, yeah, I think, I think you're right. Um, and so like here we have the situation where these people are, are, are literally going to die. And Archer feels like he has a duty to save them, even if they don't want to be saved. It's the beginning of the Incredibles all over again, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't, I think if I have to lean one way, if I have to pick a side, I would lean towards the, if you can't force them to leave. You can try to convince them. You can present arguments. You can give them evidence, but you should not be able to force them to go. Okay. They're not harming anybody else. That, that's they make, a good point. If they if they make that decision, if they all make that decision. You know, maybe you take some and not others, and those people can stay and those people can go. But 
I don't think it would be right to force them to leave. And, and to be fair, these people's death would not be a drain on anyone's resources. It would literally affect no one else. Right? Yeah. But I mean, if it'll affect the mental well-being of the Enterprise crew. Sure. But here's a, here's an interesting question, though, Chris. Um, you know, this colony is 70 years old. Uh, you know, Bernadette is 70. She had a child, which was this guy who was with her. There are assumedly children in this group of people. Like, what about them? Fair question. Um, we, I mean, we can get into children's rights and, and the state of that in society if you want to, but I feel like that's a much longer conversation. It, it is, sure. Um, yeah. Ooh. I'm trying to think of a Star Trek episode where that's going to come up, if it does. Yeah, I don't know. Strange New Worlds. That's true. Strange New Worlds. Oh, shit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Ooh, that won't be that long ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. I, yeah. Okay. I don't want to spoil anything, but yes, I forgot about that one. But yeah, the idea that, like, children can't consent, you know? So mm-hmm. do we have a do we have a duty to save their lives? Do we have a duty to respect the wishes of the children's parents, even if it's going to mean the children's death, you know, it's things like that. Yep. And those are, those are questions that we, we, you know, we, we wrestle with even today, simple things like anti-vaxxing, you know, there are people who believe that through whatever reasoning that vaccines are going to harm their children. So they don't get them. And then their children end up getting sick and sometimes dying. And also infecting other children who can't get the vaccine. Yes. But even putting that aside, like, do we as a society have a duty to make sure that those kids are safe from that kind of preventable death, even when their parents refuse to to do so? And my gut tells me yes. The thing that makes that difficult is we... We as a society in the United States have taken such a haphazard approach to that where in certain situations, so like even with vaccines, right? Like meningitis vaccines are required by a lot of school districts. But for a long that time same sort of right. That that same sort of response wasn't applied to COVID. No, it was not. So like even there and, and like, you know, People had questions about the validity of the COVID vaccine because it was um, put through emergency validation. It's um, uh, just it's as that a, haphazard approach uh, that I think uh, makes this an even more difficult topic. As a as a as a kind of uh, disclaimer, this is a pro science pro vax podcast, so uh, yeah, don't come at us with any other bullshit. Like fuck you. <laughs> Yeah, we're we're not enablers. <laughs> um, but yes, and that's exactly my my point that like the parents' reasoning was not sound, at least in the judgment of the society around them. So would it be right to force those children to be vaccinated? And like I said, my my gut says yes. Like I feel like that is a societal decision more so than a parental decision. And this, by the way, I am a parent. Chris, you are a parent. Like this is not unexperienced opinion here. Mm. Yeah. And you know, I, I agree with you. Um, I, I would probably tend to, to lean on the same side on that issue, but is that the same as a situation where everybody would die? Um, like in this, this, you know, radiation scenario is, is saving the children with vaccines the same as saving the children and leaving the parents to die. Well, the parents are the ones who made the choice, right? Like they're, they, we believe as a society that adults have, can make informed consent to things like that. Right. So like, if you believe that leaving them is the, 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 the ethical choice, which I'm not sure I agree with, but I do understand that argument. I do think that it is a similar situation to, you know, the vaccines like, Oh, okay. Well, your children can't make that choice. And, do we as a society, as, as our society say, well, then your children have to come with us. 
which does not ring well in history when we think about like the indigenous yes. schools and all the atrocities that were performed there. Well, like, think about all the 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 children that were you know saved from from like the Vietnam was it Vietnam or Korea where they they fly children out like uh, Saigon. So I guess Saigon, that's yeah, mm-hmm. Vietnam, yeah. Yep. I mean, situations like that where it's you know, was that the right thing to do? I don't know. So there is a little bit of historical precedent here. Um, We already have had a situation where people refused to be evacuated from an irradiated area at Chernobyl. Like there, there were still residents that never left the, like the, um, what's the zone closest? I can't remember what exclusion zone. I don't remember what it was called, but anyway, there were people who refused to leave. And they still live there today. And it, it's hard because radiation is really tricky, right? Um, but it, it's nonsense that, like, the children somehow gained immunity to it. Like, that was that was pure fictional storytelling. Sure. Like, the, the odds of, uh, outside of, like, acute radiation poisoning, the odds of getting cancer vary a lot from person to person because some people are just more naturally resistant to the effects of radiation on their DNA. So (laughs) them saying for certain that this population was doomed, especially knowing, according to Tabal, that it would clear up in about a decade. eh, that, That makes this more difficult for me to say one way or another. I'm more inclined to agree with Chris and say I would I would make sure that I gave each individual the ability to choose whether to leave or stay rather than just relying on their like de facto leader that we've seen through the whole episode saying sure. no nobody leaves and and you know helping them migrate but I I don't think that I would force them to Now would it change your opinion if you because you know it's the future right so maybe they have better science on this if like if if all of the science was showing that like they're guaranteed to die because you're like yeah radiation is kind of a tricky beast i totally agree would it change your answer at all if there if that if that uncertainty wasn't there if like you knew that this was going to happen um it would way more heavily on me but i i'm still leaning toward you can't force them to leave interesting okay so in and summation more, hard questions are hard yeah <laughs> like at that point it's it's more uh, taking away a person's agency is really awful sure interesting um yeah okay cool uh so yeah that's that's okay I'm trying to think of a way to wrap that because it sounds like it sounds like you two are pretty much like, eh, let them do what they're going to do. The children may be a little more of an area where you're feeling fairly uncertain. But as far as like the adults are concerned, if they want to stay and die, let them stay and die. I think that's fairly accurate. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah. And I don't I, like I, I definitely understand that argument. I don't I, I'm not I don't have I'm not going to soapbox this. I don't have any kind of like conviction on this point. I feel like I do understand an argument for like, especially because I don't. Here's here's where I was going with this. We need a moral philosophy, Professor. Uh, well, and, 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 and actually, because because. I am a big proponent of informed consent. I believe that people deserve to have as much information about a situation as possible. I wonder if that changes the equation when we consider that they are facing something that they are not like, like they are not capable of being informed properly about because they do, they fundamentally lack the understanding. Mm. Now, again, I do have trouble saying that out loud because it just harkens back to our very white colonial roots of we like, know better. yes, of we know better. And I do, I do not like that, that, that ethos, but in this situation, this is a, 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 a set ethos of, a lot in this episode. Um, because it's a fantastic word. <laughs> I, I love that word. Um, uh, and it, and it's easy to use. Like, I like the word equiangular a lot too, but we never, like, it just doesn't come up. Uh, but I wonder, like, but I, I, I feel like this, this, this episode is fundamentally different than our problematic colonial past because 
these are not, and this is kind of back to my, do they really have their own culture after only two and a half generations? These are not like indigenous people that we stumbled upon, want their land and told them to fuck off and killed them. These are people who like my dad and a person at this colony may have known each other in school. You know, these are, these are our people. They've just been lost and now refound. Does that change that at all? But didn't they claim themselves to be independent? That was the whole argument at the beginning, right? They said, you know, we don't want anybody else here. This is our home. Fuck off. I, I don't know. The last transmission made it sound like the Terranovans were not happy that they thought that the, 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 the separationist faction was like led by one dude. Hmm. And they were like, I can't believe he would do this. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't think it was clear that they were unified in that belief. That's fair. Um, even among the Terranovan colonists. All right. Well, what do you say we wrap this section up? Yeah. All right. These are tough questions. I, yeah. Everyone get back to us with a four page essay, uh, double spaced, <laughs> of course. So we can leave marks. Uh, First we got to find cheating. Uh, hmm. Uh, we're gonna take a break. We will be back. All right, welcome back, everybody. And we are going to move on to our uh, yet to be titled section three. Don't have a good name for it this week, so we'll just go with section three. Uh, and this time, after that fun, super light conversation we just had, uh, I figured uh, we would actually do something that is fun. Uh, so I prepared a little bit of Star Trek trivia for us today. Oh, God damn it. Oh, <laughs> What's, uh, uh, what, what, what range uh, of trivia? So I've got a little bit of, of, of easier ones. I've got some more challenging ones. I didn't pick anything that was super obscure. So we'll, we'll we'll see how you how you two do. Now, did you did you call these from like a list of trivia, or did you come up with these yourself? Oh no, I called them from a list of trivia. Yeah. Oh, okay, nice, nice. Um, okay, so question one: In Gene Roddenberry's original treatment for Star Trek, what was the name of the starship? Hint: It was not Enterprise. Wow, boy, I, this is I, this may shock you, but this is um, the first time I heard there was another name floated. Was it was it Excelsior? It was not. Would you like to know the answer? Or do you want to take another guess? Um. Ooh. Well, give me a hint. Was it a name of a ship that did show up at some point? Ooh, that I am not sure of. So it's not like Reliant or, or something? like Intrepid. No, it was the starship Yorktown. <sighs> Fuck, why do oh. I... I've heard that. Wait, where's... I, I, I feel like that was placed as an Easter egg. Yeah, that, that might have been. It's really familiar. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have a battleship, Yorktown, don't we? Like yeah, the America? Uh, that's, that's definitely a ship name, for sure. Yeah. All right, question two. What two stars of Star Trek Deep Space Nine were married in real life? These are main cast characters. Uh, did we just lose somebody? Did we lose Rob? Rob, you there? Oh, no. Hello? Yep, yeah, there you, there you are. Sorry about that. I hit the wrong button. Okay, did right, you did hear you, the question? You... Yes, which two characters from Star Trek Deep Space Nine were married in real life? Yes. And I have no idea. Um, <laughs> oh, I don't even know if I can make a guess. I have no concept. You just I'm going to guess it's the, the hologram <laughs> doctor and... Uh, 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 main, main characters? Like super main? Or like does that Gabo girl count? No, that does not count. You think main characters. Oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to go with, um, I'm just going to guess, because what the hell. I'm going to go with Jedzia and Odo. Uh, no, it was Bashir and Kira Norris. Oh, okay. Oh, they make a cute couple. Mm. All right. 0 for 2 so far for both of you. We are so good at this trivia. Uh, all right. Uh, you should, I think you should both get this one. Uh Question three, which Star Trek captain has an artificial heart? Oh, I know that one. Um, Wait, Rob, do you not? No. What? Oh, oh, it's a major plot point several times. Yeah, several times. Artificial heart. 
It looks dumb as hell, too. It's like this little metal yeah, heart If you thing. don't know this one, you're definitely not getting the next question. Wow, that's... Was it Cisco? No, it was, it was fucking Picard. Picard it was. Oh. Yeah, he got it's stabbed by a... Or, oh, 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 is that the next question? I didn't know this. Captain Picard has an artificial heart because of a member of what species stabbed him? Yes, he was stabbed by a... Oh, well, right, Rob, do you have a guess? Because I know. The Borg? Yeah, no. 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 Think think <laughs> earlier, because it happened in his academy days. Guess a violent alien race. Gorn. N- uh, no, it was, uh, it was a Nausicaan. Nausicaan it was. Yes, uh, slanced it right in the back through his heart. There's this whole scene of him like, oh, <laughs> like on his knees as he gets yeah. his heart fucking cut out. Yeah, he sends oh him God. back to like redo it and mm-hmm. see if he wants to redo it. It's it was an interesting episode actually. Um, um, and I, I don't. Remember that. that was not the first time we heard about his artificial heart either. I'm pretty sure it came up earlier in the show because of some thing that had happened. Yeah, it did indeed. All right, Stanford, you are two for four. Rob, you are pitching a no for. I mean, to be fair, I warned everybody coming into this. I have the least Star Trek experience of all of us. <laughs> that is true. You did say that. <laughs> All right, so question, uh, <clears throat> next question. NBC rejected the pilot for Star Trek, the original Star Trek. What famous comedian got them to take another look? Oh, I do know this. Rob, would you like to take a guess? George Carlin? <laughs> uh, ooh, before his time, maybe. Stanford, um, do you know? As Lucille Ball. Was, was was Lucille Ball, yes. And actually, I believe her, I believe the Desi Lu um, company picked up the production costs in order for NBC to, to agree to carry it. That I did not know. Interesting. I, I could be wrong on that. That's what I remember from, uh, it was like an NPR interview or something about it. But yes, it was Lucille Ball. All right. Next question. What is Deanna Troy's favorite food? <laughs> He, he he first had me have three shots of something called tequila. <laughs> What's her favorite food? Shit. This comes up a number of times throughout the series. God, my gut um, tells me melon. <laughs> like chili. Well, all right, we go with melon and chili. Well, we did sure. very yeah, different answers. As one yes, as one dish. Both are incorrect. <laughs> It is chocolate, you dopes. Oh, my God. Oh. Remember the time she has that whole thing where she, like, sexually describes eating a chocolate sundae? Jesus, no. I don't remember that at all. Oh, yeah. 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 I remember the episode where she was a cake. Yeah. She, there's a number of times it comes up that she likes chocolate on the episode. Interesting. Or on the series. Yeah. I did not. <laughs> all right. You're a Voyager guy, Stanford, so maybe you'll know this one. What species, known to the Borg as species 329, were deemed unworthy of assimilation? I gave you a hint already for this one in the intro to it, so. Unworthy. <laughs> Who would have been unworthy? So it's on Voyager. Mm-hmm. Who would have been Our, unworthy? Voyager was Dominion timeline, right? Nope, that's Deep Space Nine. Oh, that's right. Yeah, Voyager is actually in the Gamma Quadrant dealing with the Gamma Delta Quadrant, yeah, dealing with the, the Borg. It wasn't, mm, I don't know. Take a guess. Uh, the only thing I can think of is maybe like Neelix's race. Do you know what they're called? I don't. Okay. Rob, would you like to take a guess? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was the Kazon. Who are the Kazon? They're the first aliens they meet once they get beamed to the Delta Quadrant. That doesn't help. They're the ones with like, oh God, um, how to describe them. They got like the orangish brownish skin and they got like the weird like, just type in Kazon. Into, into how, search, you know, okay, it. believe it or not, I don't know how to spell fucking Kazon. So can you help me with that? A-A-Z-O-N. All right, I guess I did know how to spell Kazon. <laughs> I was I was thinking it would be a little more a little, a little trickier than that. Kazon. Oh, okay. Wow, really? All right. Yeah, they come up a couple of times. Yeah, All right. In yeah. the first couple seasons, quite a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So you guys are doing much worse than this than I expected. I made the questions too hard, apparently. Oh, but, <laughs> yeah. It was more fun because we're learning, right? Yeah. There you go. All right. Next question. Yeah. Data had a cat. 
What was its name? Oh, I know this. But Spot. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Good job. All right. What was Seven of Nine's name before she was assimilated by the board? Fuck you. Fuck. <laughs> Fuck. Gary. Hold on. Hold on. Hold it was on. Not Gary. I fucking. She, I think he said Jerry, like the actress's name. Oh sure. Fuck. Give me. Oh god damn it. Mm. Rebecca. No. Diane. <laughs> it's getting worse. Shit. My my brain is telling me something like Elmira or Maya or something of that nature, but that now that's feeling wrong and I've said it out loud to make a fool of myself. <laughs> ah, god damn it. It comes up so few times, but it did come up a couple times. It also came up in the Picard series. It did, yes. I do not remember. Monica Hansen. Veronica? Annika. 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 A-N. Yes. Okay. Got it. Yep. That's right. Okay. I didn't remember the last name, but yes, Annika. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question. What future Starfleet captain survived the Battle of Wolf 359? God. I don't even know what battle that is. It's the Borg. Um, the one where the Borg massacres a bunch of Starfleet vessels. A festivals. bunch of ships. Yeah. Takes um, place in Next Generation after uh, Picard gets assimilated. Yeah, so I'm assuming that doesn't count. Correct, yeah. Wow, what future captain? Is it one of the main captains? It is. So it had to be, uh, it had to be, um, it, it had to be Janeway then. Did it? Cisco? Unless bing, 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 bing. Cisco's not a captain. He is a captain. He gets made a captain. Oh, for that doesn't fucking count. <laughs> He's a commander. Fuck you. He attains the rank of captain. Therefore, All he right. is indeed a All captain. Right. What did he do at three five nine? Was he just a just an ensign or something? Uh, I can't remember. I don't think he was an ensign. I think he was like a lieutenant. Maybe okay. I can't remember. Yeah, I didn't. Um, I actually, I actually thought three five nine happened after the start of this uh, DS nine because no, the. No. DS9 and TNG overlap for quite a while. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's Wolf 359 happens earlier than you think it does. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's like the first big encounter with the Borg. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, next question. What actress turned down the role of Seven of Nine four times? I'm so bad with names. Is it like a real person? That sounded really <laughs> pejorative. <laughs> Yes. Is it Jerry Ryan? <laughs> it is Jerry Ryan. Good job. Oh, Ryan. nicely done. Go for the reverse psychology win. Exactly. That was a little trick question. Oh, that's nice. Um, all right. Uh, then the last three questions. Which Trek movie featured the first entirely CG sequence in film history? Um, so judging from the outrageous budget that I learned about last time, is it Star Trek The Motion Picture? Stanford, do you have a guess? I feel like that's not right. I'm thinking back through them to trying to think of where there would be a CGI sequence. Do you know what the sequence is, Chris? Uh, I can probably find out real quick. Yeah, why don't you do that while I'm thinking, because that, that seems like an important piece of information. What movie would have a CGI sequence? I mean... Oh God, there is that kind of the light tunnel thing in the first one, but that, mm, that doesn't feel... I, I'm i going to... Mm, in history, so it can't be that late. Boy, I'm going to say Star Trek... Oh, wow, boy. I'm going to say five. It was The Wrath of Khan. Really? What sequence? There is a sequence where they're animating uh, the destruction of Konos. Or no, no, not, not a Konos. Um, what is, is it Konos? It's it's the one where they show like an, ex, like a, a, an explosion. Yeah, yeah, I think it was Konos. Um, of it being like exploded, basically. What are you talking about? In rather oh, kind of, it the moon? Are you saying Kronos? Or, like the yeah, Klingon the homeworld? Yeah, it was the moon. That's what it was. It was the moon. The moon for set of Alpha at six? I think so. Oh, Hold on. I think it's the moon of Kronos. Does that 
get exploded at some point? No, not in here. I, I posted it in the, in the chat here. That's what I found when I searched for it. The Genesis device into a pre-selected area of a lifeless the Genesis body device into a pre-selected area of a lifeless. This is this is good. This is good. Fucking podcast audio right here. Yeah. Right here. What we call the Genesis effect. Oh, 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 that's what they're talking about by a CGI sequence. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, no, that was just some blank moon they found. Um, that was not the moon of, like, the Klingon home. Was it? Okay, it's been a while since I watched it. Yeah, that, that, I think even inside, I'm, I, well, I guess my point is, like, I think even inside the universe, that sequence is CGI. Like, it is a simulation right. explaining how the Genesis device works. Exactly, yeah. Interesting. I guess, I wow, that's the first completely... I was trying to think of, like, you know, like a, like with actors and shit. I didn't think mm. it was just going to be like, here's a screen with some fucking CGI on it. Like, okay, yeah, shit, fuck, okay. Fascinating. All right. What type of fish does Captain Picard keep in his ready room? It, is gold a bad answer? I didn't know he yes. kept... Oy. Wait, Picard? Picard? Picard has fish? I didn't know he that. He has a, he has a little aquarium. Is it beta? Nope. It's a lionfish. Shit, that sounds dangerous. <laughs> oh god, that's the worst fish. Dude, they're like super invasive and they're ruining Florida. Ooh, yeah, well they invaded his ass to his fucking ready room, so. Mm. Last question. What character asks Data if he is fully functional? Borgween. Uh, no. No, it's the security officer. Uh, what was her name? Tasha? Tasha Yar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rob is correct. It was indeed Tasha Yar before she went to town on him, baby. Um, <laughs> the Borg Queen asked the same question. I did not know that Tasha did as well. In first contact, the Borg Queen asked him. Uh, all right, so let's tally up. I'm surprised it's so many right answers. You actually have to tally. You just can't glance at like, oh, we got two. <laughs> it's closer in the end because you you had a good run there for a while, Stanford, and then and then you missed a bunch. But uh, Stanford, you got five out of fifteen. Rob, you got four out of fifteen. <sighs> nice. <laughs> All right, folks. Well, that wraps up our episode this week. Uh, final thoughts for from everybody. We're gonna have to do trivia again. I think that's a good. I think that's a good recurring bit. Yeah. I think we're gonna do that again. You can let us know how fucking stupid we are. <laughs> like, cause yeah, In the I, comments. I totally trust that none of you Wikipedia, like w- Wikipedia. What the fuck am I fifty? Uh, I, I trust that none of you memory alpha those answers before before going into the comments and tell us how smart you are. <laughs> All right. Have a good night. Bye bye, everybody. Thanks for listening to Captain's Log Supplemental. You can follow us on Twitter at PodCLS or send us hate mail at PodCLS3 at gmail.com.